We've now made our way through a number of Austrian pistols in this series. But now, let's see what Hungary has to offer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Othias, and this is very small. This is the Hungarian Fromer Stomp. Let's, uh, let's get this into a light box so you can see it. Weighing in at 1.3 pounds and with an overall length of just six and a half inches, this is a diminutive little handgun. It chambers the 762 Fromer cartridge and it feeds eight from a detachable box magazine. In order to talk about the stop, I first have to talk about Hungary independent from Austria-Hungary for just a moment. You see, without getting into the weeds on this one, there's a lot to the very complicated history that is Hungary. They suffered through about a century and a half of Ottoman rule, and then they ended up in Austrian rule, and then the Russians ended up kicking around in their backyard, causing general mayhem, as Russians do. And so this led to a lot of unrest and it ultimately resulted in the Great Compromise of 1867 in which it formed the dual monarchy between Austria and Hungary, making for Austria-Hungary. Under this agreement, both Austria and Hungary would have their own separate governments, ruled under a single monarch. The system should have been separate but equal, but of course we know that that would not be the case. And to be a little fair to history, the countries didn't really start off on equal footing because Austria was much more industrialized and modernized, and Hungary tended to be more of the breadbasket agrarian side of the equation. Now, still, they should have had a roughly equal experience under the monarchy, and yet it seemed that Austria kept leading the way, and they kept telling the Hungarians what to do, and... This would be an irksome process, but throughout the years together, uh, Hungary would do a lot of things to sort of lead itself down the trail of independence. And part of that would be an emphasis on its own arms production. Now, that story too is worth a deeper look, but we have only so much time today. Let's just say that it was tumultuous and it would ultimately, slowly and through many trials and tribulations, result in a company that we recognize today as FEG, FEG for me the rest of the time, and in Hungarian, a language that I do not speak, it's a garble of vowels and consonants. Alright guys, I'm going for it. FEG verish, give ya to Riesling Gassasag, god dang it! Okay guys, I surrender, I am never going to be a good wizard. Anyway, FEG was propped up as the National Arms Factory centered in Budapest, and then immediately thrown into near financial collapse. Hooray, we almost made it. Well, actually, technically they would because they were saved. Uh, they were saved by the aforementioned Credit Bank of Budapest. Now, uh, those guys took one of their management types and sent him over to basically kick everybody around and to get stuff in order. Uh, sort of a consulting slash house cleaner slash seriously I'm gonna put this boot so far up your backside until this thing runs and that man was one Rudolf Fromer born in Budapest in August of 1868 he was the son of a Jewish merchant and grew up to study business administration at the College of Commerce in 1896 this not at all an engineer would be employed by the aforementioned bank and sent to clean up the arms factory. Little did anyone know that Fromer would prove to be a natural arms designer, immediately fascinated by the factory. By 1904, he would become the director of trade, and in 1905, he became director of the Hungarian Armaments and Engineers Association. Turning back to 1899, he had a patent. Obviously inspired by the work of Mauser and Monlicker, Fromer had sketched out a pistol using a magazine in front of the trigger guard and a rotating locking bolt. More importantly, this gun works on the long recoil principle. This is something of a first on our show, so let's break that down. We are accustomed to various short recoil systems, in which the breech block and barrel recoil together for a short distance before unlocking and halting the barrel, allowing the breech block to carry on alone. 
But in long recoil, we see the breech block and barrel recoil together all the way to the rear. And then the barrel is released to go forward while the breech stays locked. Once the barrel is home, the breech is allowed to follow. There is one distinct advantage to the long recoil system. That is, since both recoil together, and then we come forward that full length, that means that you have all that time to reduce pressure to make it safe to open the breech. Everything goes out the front, and it can handle some pretty hot loads. The only problem is, it's very sensitive in that regard, because you got to move all that stuff around. I mean, it's... It's a lot of mass to get back and forth just right, and it can be a little ammo finicky. Although, that doesn't mean that it wasn't used in the early 1900s, because there are a number of systems that managed to function quite well with it. Some of the more well-known guns include the Browning Auto 5 shotgun, Remington Model 8 rifle, the Shosha machine gun, and the Mars pistol. Although, let me tell you, it's a weird system to put in a pistol. Now, 1899-1900... FEG is looking at mechanically operated repeating pistols. So kind of like the Volcanic, you got a, you know, you got a little lever or trigger thing. And I haven't found a lot of details on it. That's the best they were doing for pistols. I mean, they weren't making them, making them. They were just sort of like, eh. That's not high tech, and it's not what Austria-Hungary was looking for, because as we know from our previous episodes, a lot of them now, uh, we've got the Mondlicher 1905, and the Steyr Hahn, and the Rostengasser, and the uh, Rothkrinka M7. Uh, Austria-Hungary was taking auto-loading pistols much more seriously than other nations very early. And they had a series of trials running practically every other year from, like, 1897 all the way to, like, 1907. Now, FEG needed to get into that race. And luckily, Fromer had another idea, which he would patent in 1901. Much of our featured gun today can be seen in this design. It is a long recoil locking action and rotating bolt head, which is set into a bolt body with helical grooves just like that Monlicker 1895 long rifle. Additionally, the magazine is now in the grip and feeds from a stripper clip, and we have a clear hammer-fired system. There are so many elements from both the early Theodorovic and Krinka guns that it appears Fromer must have either been fast friends with or had a business understanding between him and Georg Roth. Otherwise, he'd be in danger of tripping over those patents. And it goes even further than that, because the gun was chambered in a clone of that Roth 1896 8mm short cartridge. Oh boy. Uh, as a matter of fact, those stripper clips that it used, again, that goes back to that old Theodorovic patent that we've already seen. Anyway, as far as the trials go, well, it appears the, the FEG's role, along with Fromer, was to just wander in at the last possible second, or usually once they were already underway, and just try to spoil it for everybody and slow down the whole process, because the 1901 would be thrown it late into the 1903-1904 trials, where it would compete against, well, we've already seen these episodes, guys. It would go into those trials, of course it didn't win, we've already covered these other episodes, but it did present some interesting considerations to the people on the board. Those considerations, however, were how to best insult a pistol, because they complained that it was overall too heavy, complicated in manufacture and in operation, it was difficult to load, it had a heavy trigger pull, uncomfortable recoil despite the mild cartridge, and a tendency to sort of double up on shots. So, one pull the trigger, double the bang for your buck. Now this is normally the part where, especially a native design, would be given an opportunity to rework the problems, come up with some solutions, and resubmit a design. Instead, the Kriegsministerium said, now nah, we're good, you guys can keep it. And then the pistol was shown off in other countries like Sweden and Great Britain and Germany and the United States, and it did no better in any of those. Sometimes worse. Sometimes people like the United States would take a gun that they were supposed to rust for 24 hours and forget about it entirely, rusting it for 42 hours, and then going, well, it really doesn't work now. Anyway, uh, that did not slow Fromer down, because in 1906, he was back at it again. Mostly, this was incremental improvements of the individual parts of the action, and most notably the addition of a detachable box magazine. Plus, it's a button release, not a heel. 
It was this design that would interrupt the showdown between the Krinka and the Monlicker in one of our previous episodes. And this time it went much better for the Fromer. It was praised for being accurate, reliable, and the detachable magazine was very easy to use. But it was still awkward to handle, especially the safety. Still extremely complicated, much worse than the competition, and, well, they really wanted a stripper clip. We've talked about that stripper clip issue before, but I feel like while I have the opening, let's talk about it one more time. This comes up a lot. I have questions about it very frequently. Why would you prefer a stripper clip instead of detachable magazine? And not just for pistols, but for rifles. Here's the thing. Austria-Hungary was married to the stripper clip because they were looking for a readiness plan. They wanted to have all of their ammunition set up, pre-packaged, ready to go. That means no loose rounds. They don't want anybody on the front line, especially where there's now muck, mud, dirt, whatever that you can introduce in the magazine. They want magazines or clips or whatever loaded in sanitized environments, okay? So it has to be ready, grab, unwrap, shove, go, all right? You can do that with a detachable magazine. That's a realistic thing. The only problem is if you wanna do it with a detachable magazine, Every detachable magazine has to have the spring and follower in it. They all have to be done in such a way that they will feed perfect from every gun in the Empire. Now, you guys know, uh, if you're personal arms owners, that you've definitely had handguns or something before in your life or known somebody that has one that it just doesn't like this brand of mag and it doesn't like... When you're talking about building hundreds of thousands of things, no, nah, we're not doing that, okay? Uh, and then second, it's extremely expensive because you have to put a spring and follower in every single one of them, and it's more metal all the way around, all right? And then third, there was concern that when they went to store these things for possibly over a decade, two decades, who knew? You know, there was time between wars for a while there. Well, what happens if it's all piled full of rounds and the springs, which, by the way, aren't, you know, as good as modern springs, but still pretty good, what happens when they start to kind of sag and age? Eh, or if you want to worry about rust building up in a moving action instead of just a clip where if it has a little rust you just shove through the rust so then you gotta oil it but what if you fill it with cosmoline or something equivalent and then it just gums up every action you feed it into having a stockpile of magazines is expensive and complicated and risky and so you definitely see countries avoid magazine loading rifles for sure but with Austria-Hungary, because they were sort of, they found the pistol, they're the opposite of the Japanese. They found the pistol to be very important. And so they treated it like they treated their rifles. They wanted lots of ammo readily available. Well, just for the same reasons as the rifle, it goes to the stripper clip. So that means the 1906 is also out of the picture. And again, Fromer is undeterred because he's going to keep on pushing and we're going to see another model. In late 1908, he would come up with another refinement of his system. This was the direct precursor to our gun today. And because it was adopted in 1910 by the Hungarian gendarmerie, it is often called the Model 1910. Overall, it's smaller than the 1901 and 1906 and chambers the 765 Fromer short cartridge, shorter than 32 ACP. But it was loaded hot, likely nearly equaling its power. Now this gun incorporated further small improvements to the action. Small simplifications to the barrel and breech block catchment system, trigger setup, and it included an automatic grip safety. Again, something we'll see carry over. Now the 1910 had a little bit better of a time in the market. Uh, it sold uh, a little bit commercially, and it was approved for adoption by the gendarmerie and would see some issue there. However, it was not a military cartridge pistol. The army was not interested. They were still married to the M7. Even the Steyr Han couldn't break that, as you recall. There was really nowhere for this gun to go. Uh, it could have tried to compete a little more heavily in the commercial market, but here's the thing. It didn't look right. It, it, was, an, it was like the last most modern, old-school semi-automatic pistol because... As we're going to see, the shape of what is considered a modern handgun is really defined at that time. Looking around, by 1911, we're seeing some really familiar handgun designs, and it seems that people are beginning to settle into a common form factor. Additionally, some cartridges were floating to the top. In particular, 32 ACP was now practically universal. And so, in 1911, Fromer would develop another pistol and submit it for patent. This time, he was going to rework his 1910 to fit the modern mold. 
Here, we can see the two necessary springs for long recoil action, one for the breech block and the other for the barrel, are now fitted over top of the barrel. This allowed Fromer to compact the whole gun as much as possible, designing around the shortest usable length while still going with a long recoil system. You may recognize that this is not the plain Fromer stop. As a matter of fact, right along with our pistol today, Fromer introduced a baby model. Now, this was not a military pistol, so it won't be our focus, but despite its size, it was offered in the same two cartridges as the full-size model. The first was the 32 Fromer cartridge, which was a direct copy of 32 ACP, although generally loaded with more powder. The stop could handle this thanks to its locking action over the common blowback 32 pistol. Less well known is the 9mm Fromer round, which again is just another stolen idea. It's 380 guys, again, loaded up. Personally, if I were Colt, I'd tell Fromer to stop. The 380 version is nearly identical to the 32, except for a magazine count of only 7 instead of 8 rounds. While not as common commercially, they represented something like a third of all military contracts, yet remain extremely rare today. I have no idea why. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at just what this gun is. So, zooming in, first of all, she is dark and sleek, but uh, here's our over top tube that has our springs. We'll see more about that in the animation. Uh, we have a very modern looking right angle design, nice grip angle, a automatic grip safety, and a hammer fire right back there. The magazine is detachable box with a heel release. One of the easier ones to use, but still I'm sure May is going to have some words about that like she usually does. Uh, the bolt does not stay open, sadly, which makes this a little bit difficult to clean or work with. There's no hold open, lock open whatsoever. And then we would have to squeeze, pull, and let that hammer down, but I'm going to let it down nice and gentle. There we go. And that, overall, is our stop. Now, of course, what you guys are really curious about is how the heck to take this thing apart. And believe me, I would not recommend an actual field strip in the field. So first we'll drop our magazine. We know we have no ammo. Uh, the manual would tell you to use the magazine uh, toe to depress this little detent right there. Now I'm gonna skip that and just go with a much easier screwdriver. Now just for your own education with the patented plastic pokey hand, I will show you that little guy is gonna get pressed in and then this overall collar is gonna rotate to the left. I cannot really do that easily on camera without making a mess of everything, so I'm gonna pull this aside. Now, as I unscrew this, this is still under spring pressure. There's a collar in here underneath, underneath this, the actual screw-on threaded collar. There's a bracket, plate, whatever you wanna call it. It's in a figure eight. That also can contain the spring pressure, which will fool you because you will unscrew it thinking that the spring is contained, and then when you least expect it, ha-ha! So, be careful, keep a thumb on there, keep the pressure up, and then get your thumb out of the way, and then fight with the detent again, over and over and over again until you can get this thing apart. It is a kind of equivalent to wrestling a squirrel, guys. And it's gonna take me just a moment, and I'm gonna pull it back into my lap. All right, just to prove what I'm talking about, let me show you a terrifying magic trick. Oh God, okay. See, it's being contained ever so barely, and yeah, it could go at any moment. So let's just go ahead and wiggle that out. Okay, whoo, whoo, doggy. This little guy. This is the guy that will fool you into a false sense of security. And he's got our little bead in there. Don't lose him because he's going to fall out. Really, guys, I don't know why anybody was ever expected to take this thing apart uh, without losing everything. So I'm going to set him aside. Oh, by the way, this uh, is meant to be a tool as well. There's a notch right here that's going to be used in the next portion. So let me get this first spring out. All right, and now what I can do is at the very end here, can you guys see that? There is a lifted blade like the end of a screwdriver. You can take this notch, put it on there, give her a push and a twist 90 degrees. And what that's going to do, as you see in the back, we've now released the breech block. See, no longer attached to its spring. So the breech block can now be pulled to the rear and over the hammer. 
And now with the breech block out of there, you can turn this back the other way and careful it's under some spring tension, but not a lot. Turn it back the other way. And now she comes out the front with her spring. Now, if all this looks like a confusing mess, don't worry, it's better to see it in the animation anyway. It'll make a lot more sense. At this point, the barrel is also free to come loose. So we've got our barrel and we've got our breech block. And this is basically a miniaturized version of the 1895 rifle because it is a helical groove fit inside of a bolt body in order to rotate and lock the bolt. Absolutely insanely complicated for a handgun, let alone an overcharged 32 AZP. And we're not talking about a super big significant overcharge. All right, now, thankfully, I have not committed to reassembling things on the show. And honestly, this looks like it needs a little bit of cleaning anyway. So uh, let's just kick you guys over to that animation so you, you can hopefully understand how all of this actually interplays with each other. All right, guys, this is a long recoil pistol, so this is gonna get kind of weird. First, let's notice that both the barrel and the breech block recoil together, and then the barrel goes forward on its own, and then the breech block follows. Now, when that barrel goes forward, it goes along with an ejector that's going to press the cartridge out to the right as the breech block's extractor simply holds on to it. It's inverted from the normal relationship where the ejector sits there and the extractor moves. The safety is fairly simple. It simply blocks the path of the trigger bar. The breech block itself is held to the rear by a lever that flips up as it gets into position. When the barrel goes forward, the back rear of it is going to press down on that lever, freeing the breech block to then go forward as well. The forward motion of the barrel also unlocks the breech block, which don't forget has its own separate bolt head and locking lug. All right, guys, I think that's everything. So let's get it over to May. First up, I'm going to load it with 32 ACP. All in all, not bad, but let's try something else. This is 32 Frommer. So, not a huge difference. <laughs> Neat. Alright, so, uh, by the way, this pistol was loaned to us by our own Susie. This is from her personal collection. Back when I was doing only World War II stuff, she fell in love with this sitting in a pawn shop. And you'll all be sickened to know that she spent $100 on it. And they called us three days later and say, you forgot your holster. And then we went to pick up the holster and there was an original spare magazine with it as well. Some people are just jerks. Anyway, uh, neat little gun. Now, these things saw really good commercial sales. They were the first commercially successful design for FEG. The only thing is, they still weren't luring in military sales. Uh, there's a lot of sources that will tell you that they were adopted by the general military in 1912, 
but I'm going to put my faith more in Mutz and Choi on this one and say that it looks like, at best, these were approved for gendarmerie use before the war. But of course, as we all know, history tends to change when war were declared. It seems almost right away the Hungarian Hunzvegzeg, sorry guys, uh, the Hungarians version of the Landwehr, their domestic army, they would go ahead and buy up a large pile of the commercial 9mm Fromers. I'm unsure of how many. Now, this is a lot like Austria going for the Steyr Huns to the, put them in their Landwehr. So, by the middle summerish of 1915, uh, Vienna is starting to feel the pinch over on their side. They need some more pistols, and the authorities in Budapest they decide to be nice and say, "Hey, hey, hey, Feg has these things. Do you need them?" And the Austrians, of course, go, uh, "No, we're fine. Uh, those look Hungarian." And also, to be fair to them, they're a little bit concerned about introducing yet another uh, pistol cartridge into their supply chain. Now that part made sense. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six native designs, all using a different cartridge at this point. They would reconsider that opinion just one month later and go ahead and buy up 1,000 nine millimeter Fromer stops. And then, well, they had adopted the Steyr Piper 1909 like we have seen before, so, good time as any to go ahead and load up on 32 as well. So they put in a contract for 11,000 of exactly this guy. Now, uh, in August of 1916, they would turn around and say, you know what, we've been ordering these 32s. By the way, it wasn't just one set of 11,000. After that, they kept going. Well, August 1916, they're like, the 32s are doing well, but actually we kind of like the nine millimeters, so we want another 20,000 of those. And we understand that you don't have the ability to run both assembly lines, so Open up what you need to do. Let's go more Fromer stops all the way around. Now, uh, by the way, while all these are being bought, the price for one of the little puppies would rise ever so slightly throughout the years, but by the end of the war, you're looking at 69 kroner. Now, in terms of quality, the Fromer stops got it uh, in most regards. There was some complaint about extraction, although I have not experienced that. They supposedly came out with an improved extractor and went into testing. I did not find where it was ever implemented though. And honestly, I doubt it was the biggest deal, especially when you're going along with what is a pocket pistol at this point. It's equivalent to the Austrian side's Steyr Piper. It's not the frontline service pistol like the Steyr Hahn or that uh, Rothkrinka M7. Now, uh, one thing that did sort of decline during the war years was the finish. Instead of a bright, deep blue, a lot of them kind of look gray and worn out nowadays and that mostly comes from the fact that the bluing was so poorly applied that it just sort of rubbed off over the past hundred or so years. Whether or not that actually kicked off some concern uh, is a little debatable because next thing you know the artillery Zugs Depot is going why are we having these pistols split up and sent to either Budapest or Vienna and then inspected for service? we should go ahead and inspect these pistols at the factory. That gives us the best chance of fixing problems right there. We spend a lot less uh, time and energy on shipping them back and forth. Well, this chafed the Hungarians just a little bit, but realistically it is the right call. Now, if you're curious, those inspection stamps can be found on the trigger guard, uh, just like so with the two digit date. Honestly, it's amazing that any were accepted because there were a number of challenges to production, including running out of coal, which resulted in a shutdown in January of 1918 from the 15th to the 28th. Further material shortages halted the night shift production lines forever, starting that February. That March, increased conscription hit the plant, ripping away 700 able men from a staff of just under 3,500. This probably contributed to another shutdown from March 8th to the 15th. Overall output would drop by 30%. Woof. Now, with all of that, Vienna demanded more production. As a matter of fact, they had been issuing these just to the landware for a while, but mm, with shortages, it was suddenly creeping into frontline units. Uh, the Fromer stop was starting to be more and more important, and so, uh, instead of just buying little lots, 
Austria's side of Austria-Hungary wanted half of all production, as was obviously fair, you guys. So, uh, from then on, they would just split what they could get out of production between Vienna and Budapest. An audit in April of 1918 revealed 39,450 total 9mm and 93,450 total 7.65mm Fromer stops delivered to date. These numbers combined to make for 132,900 overall, and by the end of the war it's estimated another 7,330 were delivered. But the breakdown between which caliber is which is unknown. By the way, this only includes contracts delivered. The snatched up commercial pistols would also increase this total if we just knew how many. It could be as high as 250,000 total. Alright, that's a lot of gats, but does that make them good gats? Well, in terms of a military pistol, I find the Fromer to be a little unusual. It's a little too compact, a little too mild. And if we're being honest in an assessment, even kind of containing the cartridge and everything else, this is a ridiculously complex system. And long recoil is not great at being reliable under pressure. And the benefits of having that locked breech are really not there in a gun this small with such a mild cartridge. I think it was just there and convenient. Uh, it's definitely interesting, it's definitely fascinating, but there's some real downsides. And by the way, included in those are my earlier statement that you can't lock the action open to clean it, so once it's gunked up, you kind of have to fiddle with it and put special tools in there just to clean it back out. And then two, a real problem on these guns that I have actually found personally is that at the front, this sort of metal tube that is the receiver in this case, well, it can get crushed very easily. And there's even a little wear mark on this one. And we were having some jamming issues until I took this apart and actually spread the metal back out some and reshaped that inner collar so that it would all fit together much more nicely and smoothly. So the ability to just sort of pinch this, especially when it's in a soft shell leather holster on your hip and then you bang up against something, it's very probable. And if it's causing jams for us, it could cause jams for them. All of that said, the Fromer Stop is not the most unusual gun in the war. That would go to this, the 17M, a cradle-mounted pair of inverted Fromer Stops with extended barrels and extended magazines to form a crude Villa Perosa-esque micro-machine gun. What is it with Austria-Hungary and double pistols? Again, this never saw adoption, probably because they were smart enough to just actually clone the Villa Perosa. Now, the end of World War I did not see the end of the Fromer Stop. Instead, it was readopted by the newly independent Hungary as the Pistol 19M, and it would continue in service for a number of years. Now, uh, sometime in the mid-20s, commercial production would finally wrap up. I'm hazy on the details, and it's really not our ballpark today, but the gun did great overall compared to any other product that was put out by FEG up until that point, and it really started to put them into the market to be a commercial pistol manufacturer that's still somewhat recognizable today. Now, uh, militarily, this gun was displaced by the Model 29M. Turning back to Rudolf Fromer, in 1914 he would become CEO of FEG and was given an honorary engineering degree. Plus, he was knighted. Dang. He would go on to serve as an advisory member of the Hungarian Senate but remained head of FEG until he retired due to illness in 1935. He would pass away of that same illness in September of 1936. And with all that, we're wrapped up. So, I think it's time to go find May and put her right there and talk about this guy here. Alright, we're down to episode 51, so if you guys don't know what this situation is, I can't help you. We have May, we have a gun, and we're going to ask one about the other. Gun, what do you think about May? She's great! Then we've got to stop doing this. Alright, so, uh, here's your handgun. Ooh. Why don't you go through the usual, walk us through the ergonomics of the Fromer Stop. Alright, so, before I get super into the ergonomics of this guy. I just want to point something out. This is a very bizarre looking gun. I mean, even compared to some of the standard pistols we've handled thus far, it's still very weird looking. I mean, look at this like breech block set up up here. It basically looks like the shape of the Enterprise almost. Isn't that weird? Um, but no, I'm sorry. L let me get out of Star Trek and get more into the gun. Um, 
it's a very small, small pistol. Like, I mean, in my hand, it doesn't look too small. I'm able to get a full finger grip, but when you put someone's hand like Matthias here, yeah, he's, he's got like his pinky hanging off. He doesn't get a full finger grip. So this is, this is a fairly tiny pistol and it does not have a lot of weight to it. It's very light. For me, this is actually quite comfortable. Like the slope here in the back is, is just kind of contours naturally to the inside of my palm. And my finger kind of wants to fall straight parallel to the like barrel set up here. Like everything about this just actually feels fairly comfortable, which was surprising. Um, into the magazine. God, I hate heel safeties. Why are they a thing? This one, luckily the spring pressure on here isn't strong. Isn't that strong. And there are little grooves like notched into the actual operation of this button. So like, I'm able to grip it and manipulate it well enough, but I still don't like the fact that I have to use a heel release. They're just not that comfortable. Luckily the mag for this guy did come free enough and there's a little bit of a toe here that I'm able to get a good solid finger on to kind of hook it out, but still just not my favorite in the heat of battle. I could see that being kind of a little bit of a snagging thing. Um, the safety on this gun, as you guys saw in the video, I had to kind of like release my grip in order to actually show the operation of it and use. However, that being said, um, even though it is awkward to hold in your hand and use, it's when you let go of the gun, you just know it's safe, which that in itself isn't a bad thing. Um, I think that's fine. But the problem is, is that if I've got it in my hand, I don't want to kind of have a loose grip with it in order to definitely know it's in safety mode. That's a little bit awkward. Um, and last but not least, operating the breech block on this guy. It's got some grasping grooves luckily here in the back so that I'm able to get a good finger grip on here even though there's not much to grip. And luckily the breech block doesn't have a lot of weight pulling against it so you're able to manipulate it fairly easily in my opinion. Just make sure when you're actually cycling rounds with this, when you're actually chambering the first round, you let it snap forward. Really try not to ride that because I had some issues on range a little bit here and there, but we'll get into that later. Um, overall though, ergonomics, it's a very strange looking little pistol, but you know, it wasn't too bad. It feels pleasant in your hand. Now, before anybody gets confused, may I? No. About the statement about trying to have the safety engage while the gun is drawn. I do believe you were not talking about combat. You were talking about the fact that on range, every once in a while, we'll end up with a live round, and you always want to be able to get in a situation where you have the gun on safe, even though nobody's crossing in front of you. Yeah. Anyway, there are times when we do not want to have to unload, reload, go through everything else. We want to just sort of put it on safe, muzzle it down, and then everybody behind gets everything ready or reset, and then we tell them it's clear, and then they can muzzle back up and take it off. So I hope that what we're describing is this sort of weird sensation where you're trying to let the gun be on safe, but not necessarily... Anyway, that's... That's, that's actually a fair assessment, yes. Okay. So, um, we rely on manual safeties every once in a while when we're working on range. Not with anybody downrange. Don't count your life on a manual safety or automatic safety, for that matter. No. Now, in a combat setting, though, a grip safety, if you're going to have to have a safety, and if you're talking about officers that might shoot themselves in the leg on occasion, uh, grip safety is not a terrible idea. I know a lot of people hate them for obvious reasons, and certainly you can train around the grip safety, and you should train around the grip safety. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about conflict like World War One, the more automatic a safety feature is probably the better. Um, I know people don't like magazine safeties either. And honestly, for a personal gun, I would not want a magazine safety. But if we're talking about issuing them, you know, en masse and we don't want any accidents, it's not necessarily a bad idea in sort of the gross field, in the field of we have barely trained people that are running up into this conflict and need to be armed quickly and not have any stupid misunderstandings with their firearm. That's fair. So, um, let me give this back to you. Okay. And let's talk about actually shooting the Fromer stop and how that feels. All right, guys, starting out with the sights, these are interesting. So they made the rear sight really tall and it looks fairly big, right? I mean, maybe you guys can't see it, but it's tall enough. Take my word for it. Yet, T-tiny notch. Tall sight, T-tiny notch. What? You had so much room here to play with, guys, and you had to give me a T-tiny sight to look with that? Like, seriously, there was an opportunity missed there. Thanks. Um, the trigger, I will say, it's very muddy, and then, unfortunately, the brake was not clean. I knew when this gun was going to go off. There's definitely a lope in there that you can feel, and you just, 
I don't appreciate that. Seriously, they should have taken a little more time with that trigger. Now for the recoil. This gets interesting because this gun here, it's got a low bore axis. And so that does help with recoil management. Don't get me wrong. It didn't feel like it wanted to snap. And of course, being 32 ACP in the cartridge, or we did try a harder load, 32 Frommer, which both weren't bad. However, that being said, I've got like all this mass in the breech block coming all the way back, which that doesn't help with the recoil. That actually adds to it. So I feel like it kind of just evened itself out. Like it didn't really feel like any different from any 32 ACP that I shot previously. So it's good and bad in there, I guess, mixed with it. But overall as a shooter, I drilled a pretty decent like grouping with this guy. I, I thought I was fairly accurate with it. Um, but we do need to get into some more details about that, don't we? Yep, that's right. If you saw our previous video that explains how we make our videos, you probably saw me trying to feed a few rounds into this thing desperately. Um, we ran into a couple problems with this gun, the first of which I can cover quickly, which is that this serial matched magazine did not like to feed rounds. We had another magazine, thankfully, and it just locked in a little bit tighter and it fed much better. Yeah, M much, it was much. insane, the difference. Yes. So, um, that's one thing. But then it felt like there was a couple other creepy little details that stacked up against this gun. Would you like to talk about the downside of the Fromer stop? Well, yeah. So first things first, when we took this gun out to the range, which by the way, our first time picking it out was not the first time you guys saw the footage. We just kept running into problems where it was just not wanting to chamber the next round. Like we couldn't figure out at first what was doing it until we just happened to notice when slowing one of the videos down that the hammer would come back and bump the top of my hand. On this gun, it actually prefers for you to ride it a little bit low because if you ride it too high, that hammer can possibly touch the top of your hand and just basically cause an issue with the breech blocks with breech block with loading the next round. Like it was bizarre how we figured that out, but it took us like a whole day to kind of assess that problem. So this guy actually does like for you to grip it low, which is a little bit awkward if you're just trying to grab it quickly and you know fire at someone. I don't want to have to think to have to hold it low, so that's a little bit weird. Um, now, like I said before, we shot 32 ACP and then 32 Frommer. The 32 ACP did fine. No issues with jamming or anything that did perfectly. You know, aside from loading the first round, like I said, you just got to make sure you snap it back. It really doesn't like you to ride the breech at all, which you typically don't want to do that anyway, but just holding it back too long, it just tended to not like that. But anyway, um, getting into the actual cartridges. Like I said, 32 ACP defined. The 32 Frommer though, we'd notice like one in every, or one or two in every 30, it just would jam and it just wouldn't want to cycle that round, which was weird. Like, I mean, we don't really know what the combination, what actually might've been the reason for that. Maybe it had to do with the hand loads or something. We're not entirely sure, but we just happened to notice this guy actually just preferred the 32 ACP. Now, thinking about those jams, how do you clear a jam on this guy? Well, there's no hold open, so you've got to fiddle with the heel release to get the mag out, and then you've got to try to hold back this breech block and basically like jiggle it around, which is totally not safe on range. Like clearing jams on this guy wasn't like just not comfortable thing to have to do. So seriously, being, I can't imagine being a soldier on the battlefield having to do that, and then like just imagine you're trying to clean your gun. What? No, you've got to take it apart, which this is just a complicated disassembly in general, so that surely wasn't fun. But yeah, this, this guy had definitely a couple of concerning problems. Yeah, and I will point out one really big problem with that sort of jam is we had at least one occasion where we had a partial feed, which means that even with the heel, you have to hold the heel release back, it wants to spring forward, and then yank down on that little finger of a magazine, but you have a partial feed, so you're stuck. Okay, so then you want to pull the bolt back so that you can get a pocket knife or something in there and flick that cartridge out into the chamber, at least something to get it out of the way, but you can't. You gotta, you gotta have somebody hold the gun, hold it open, point it in a safe direction, and then have somebody else get in there and flick the dang cartridge. Hold opens are kind of important, especially <laughs> with little ports like this. I mean, it, it really became a severe headache just for one jam, and we only had like three. Yeah. But, when one takes 10 minutes, you start to notice them. So, unfortunately, I think there's a little lack of military polish in this highly polished civilian gun, in my mind. But, we have our uh, pseudo-expert now. Uh, we have a video of her shooting a bunch of gats. 
So that makes her some sort of an authority. Let's get her opinion ha. on whether or not she would take the Fromer stop into the Great War. Guys, I absolutely love this pistol. And I don't ever want to see this leave our collection. I really don't. I would not bet my life on this, though. I mean, this gun is ingenious. It's a long recoil pistol. Ingenious, but entirely unnecessary. They could have just made this in blowback and made it better, but they didn't. So I love the uniqueness of it, and I, I would like the idea of taking it with me, but I sure as heck wouldn't want to bet my life on her. Or with her, I guess. I would have to concur. Um, I'm fascinated by the Frommer stop. I don't think a pe people appreciate just how weird of a design it is. And honestly, go back and look at Bruno's animation. It's brilliant. I mean, I'm sorry, it's brilliant. You got a low bore axis, your springs are up top, you got a full long recoil action compacted into the tiniest, tiniest package possible. I, I don't know that there's a better way to do a long recoil pistol. Why would you do a long recoil pistol? I'm 32 ACP at that. Yes, I, I mean, <laughs> Maybe one day we'll talk about the Mars, not for World War One. I, I know, Battlefield 1. But there are other attempts at long recoil pistols and things like that in order to get... There's a benefit, okay? You have this longer stroke, there's more time to release gas pressure, you could use it to build potentially a hotter loaded pistol. And yes, they oomph up on the 32 ACP a, a bit, a bit, but you could still put... You, it, those cartridges aren't going to blow up a blowback either, though. You could have gotten away with it. He's really upset about this, guys. It doesn't make sense. Now, the 380 maybe makes a little sense, but not really because 380 is also a blowback cartridge. What? The Beretta 34. Anyway, I shouldn't complain this much because I am a man who has done hour and a half long YouTube shows that have eaten up 90 hours a week on occasion. For a small number of subscribers in the big picture of things, I could do fart jokes for 10 minutes and honestly... Okay, so maybe Fromer and I, uh, Fromer is my spirit animal, but that doesn't mean that we're betting our life on this pistol. All right, so I think that wraps this up, unless you have anything else. No, I just now want to know what my spirit animal is. Don't you dare say the Reich's revolver. I would never. Yeah. It's not. Okay. If you think you know what my spirit animal is, please place it in the comments below. Good. All right, thank you all, and have a good one. Bye. Alright guys, time for your update. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since I've really sat down for one of these, and I need to cover a number of things. One, we went over to the NRA annual meeting a few weeks back in order to catch up with some, you know, fellow enthusiasts, uh, fellow channel guys, and a lot of you fans. And I was frankly surprised at how often we were recognized. If you were one of those people, I'm very happy to have met you, and I'm sure I've already been emailing you back and forth as it is. Now, on to more recent news. We are continuing forward in our mission to document all of World War I as best as possible. And as part of that, one of the good and kind hookups we made out at Atlanta, well, we're getting set up in November to film about eight or nine World War I era machine guns. And then we have another contact who's offering another eight or nine different World War I machine guns, hopefully sometime late this year, early next year. That gives us two chances to stock up and get you guys more informed on the automatics. Now this is tricky because I have to do all the research ahead of time and in batch, so I essentially have to write eight episodes between now and November, in addition to the regular episodes, just so that I can properly film what we're going to be doing with those. So forgive me if I'm not as communicative as normal. Now, I am trying to do one thing to keep you all more informed. So those of you who are patrons, even at the $1 level, I'm really making a concerted effort in starting now, and I'm saying this publicly so that I will remember it, 
I'm going to make an effort to actually fill you guys in each week as to what we've been doing for that week. Uh, I'm usually more careful about behind-the-scenes stuff, and I don't know why. I think it's just a natural thing to want to be a little secretive when you're trying to put on a full feature show like this because you don't want to give away everything. But for those of you who don't mind spoilers, I'm just going to start sharing them because I found that when I do, well, you guys tend to turn out the resources to help get it done. Alright, so another reason to maybe be a patron, but otherwise, smooth sailing. We'll talk to you guys later.